My name is Chloe Cole, and I am a detransitioner. Another way to put that would be, I used to believe that I was born in the wrong body, and the adults in my life whom I trusted affirmed my belief, and this caused me lifelong irreversible harm. I speak to you today as a victim of one of the biggest medical scandals in the history of the United States of America. I speak to you in the hope that you will have the courage to bring the scandal to an end and ensure that other vulnerable teenagers, children, and young adults don't go through what I went through. At the age of 12, I began to experience what my medical team would later diagnose as gender dysphoria. I was well into an early puberty, and I was very uncomfortable with the changes that were happening to my body. I was, intimida I was intimidated by male attention, and when I told my parents that I felt like a boy, in retrospect, all I meant was that I hated puberty, that I wanted this newfound sexual tension to go away, that I looked up to my brothers a little bit more than I did to my sisters. I came out as transgender in a letter I sent on the dining room table. My parents were immediately concerned. They felt like they needed to get outside help from medical professionals, but this proved to be a mistake. It immediately set our entire family down a path of ideologically motivated deceit and coercion. The gender specialist I was taken to, taken to see told my parents that I needed to be put on puberty-blocking drugs right away. They asked my parents a simple question. Would you rather have a dead daughter or a living transgender son? The choice was enough for my parents to let their guard down, and in retrospect, I can't blame them. This was the moment that we all became victims of so-called gender-affirming care. I was fast-tracked onto puberty blockers and then testosterone. The resulting menopausal like hot flashes made focusing on school impossible. I still get joint pains and weird pops in my back, but they were far worse when I was on the blockers. A month later, when I was 13, I had my first testosterone injection. It's caused permanent changes to my body. My voice will forever be deeper, my jawline sharper, my nose longer, my bone structure um, permanently masculinized, my Adam's apple more prominent, my fertility unknown. I look in the mirror sometimes and I feel like a monster. I had a double mastectomy at 15. They tested my amputated breast for cancer. And I was cancer free, of course. I was perfectly healthy. There was nothing wrong with my still developing body or my breasts other than that as an insecure teenage girl. I felt awkward about it. After my breasts were taken away from me, the tissue was incinerated. Before I was able to legally drive, I had, part, I had a huge part of my future womanhood taken from me. I will never be able to breastfeed. I struggle to look at myself in the mirror at times. I, 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 still, I still struggle to this day with sexual dysfunction. And I have massive scars across my chest. And the skin grafts that they use, that they took of my nipples, are weeping fluid today. And they were grafted into a more masculine positioning, they said. After surgery, my grades in school plummeted. Everything that I went through did nothing to address my underlying mental health issues that I had. And my doctors, with their theories on gender, thought that all my problems would go away as soon as I was surgically transformed into something that vaguely resembled a boy. Their theories were wrong. The drugs and surgeries changed my body, but they did not and could not change the basic reality that I am and forever will be a female. When my specialist first told my parents that they could have a dead daughter or a live transgender son, I wasn't suicidal. I was a happy child who struggled because she was different. However, at 16, after my surgery, I did become suicidal. I'm doing better now. But my parents almost got the dead daughter promised to them by my doctors. My doctors had almost created the very nightmare they said they were trying to avoid. So what message do I want to bring to American teenagers and their families? I didn't need to be lied to. I needed compassion. I needed to be loved. I needed to be given therapy to help me work through my issues, not affirm to my delusion that by transforming into a boy, it would solve all my problems. We need to stop telling 12-year-olds that they were born wrong, that they are right to reject their own bodies and feel uncomfortable with their own skin. We need to stop telling children that puberty is an option, that they can choose what kind of puberty they will go through, just so they can choose what clothes to wear or what music to listen to. Puberty is a rite of passage to adulthood, not a disease to be mitigated. Today, I should be at home with my family celebrating my 19th birthday, and instead I'm making a desperate plea to my elected, rep my elected representatives. 
learn the lessons from other medical scandals like the opioid crisis, to recognize that doctors are human too, and sometimes they are wrong. My childhood was ruined along with thousands of detransitioners that I know through our networks. This needs to stop. You alone can stop it. Enough children have already been victimized by this barbaric pseudoscience. Please let me be your final warning. Thank you. Today's your birthday? It is. You're a beautiful, brave woman. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Ms. Reynolds, you're next. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Miriam Reynolds. I'm a licensed professional counselor, a fifth generation Texan descending from a long line of conservative Christians, and I'm the mother of a transgender son. I am honored to be here today to give my testimony and tell you the story of my incredible child. He recently became an adult and I will still refer to him as a child. His name is Cameron and he is 18 years old. He recently graduated from high school and is embarking on, embarking on adulthood with a gap year before college. Cameron told us he was transgender when he was 11 years old. He was clearly dealing with something, but we didn't know what it was or how to help him. But then he told us. My husband and I had the same instinct to tell him that we love him no matter what and always will be there for him. We, needed, <clears throat> we knew we needed to affirm him from our years in working with foster youth, but we had no idea what to do next. We were scared. We didn't know anyone who had a trans child. We had never even heard of gender affirming care. I prayed that it was a phase, but already knew that it wasn't. The signs had been there all along. We just didn't understand them. We thought he was a tomboy. He refused to wear anything pink or girly and was the only girl on the boys' football team for many years. His best friends were always boys. There were a lot of signs looking back. As parents, all we really want for our children is for them to be happy and healthy. Prior to receiving gender-affirming care and socially transitioning, my child was not happy and was not able to be his true self. I didn't want him to have to face the struggles of being transgender, but I did want him to be happy and himself. At times, I grieved my little girl and felt as if she were gone. It was hard on me at first, but I was able to put my child's needs before my feelings and find him the care he needed. I could see that my child was happier and felt more and more comfortable the more he was affirmed. We were living in Colorado at the time, and through some research found a comprehensive program at a local hospital that provided health care to trans kids. We found him a counselor immediately began trying to provide him <clears throat> with the best health care we could find. We felt very fortunate to have access to a multidisciplinary team of professionals who could help us figure out what options we had for Cameron's health care. I could not imagine having to manage legal restrictions of medical care in addition to talking to our extended family, all while learning ourselves about treatment options and caring for our child. Later that year, we decided to move to Texas. We began researching leading programs in the field of trans health care and were able to find a similar program. We chose to move to a town based on proximity to the clinic. We knew we needed the support of experts. We had an appointment scheduled before we even arrived in Texas or had any idea of our health insurance coverage. <clears throat> our multidisciplinary team at the clinic consisted of physicians, nurses, social workers, psychologists, medical students, my son's counselor, the school counselor, my husband and I as parents, decision makers, and my son as a patient. We filled out many, many surveys and questionnaires. Myself, Cameron, and his dad were all required to do so. We had extensive interviews with social workers and psychologists who had requested a letter from Cameron's previous provider prior to our first appointment. The intake process was lengthy and meticulous. The process was daunting, but I was grateful that the team was so thorough. I wanted I want to make it clear that the care we received was slow, very thoughtful, provided with the utmost care and consideration. There was no rush, absolutely no coercion, lots and lots of double checking and making sure we were all on the same page. At the time, Cameron felt it was all moving too slowly. In retrospect, I, we can see clearly that it was the best thing for us to move so slowly on medical interventions so we could properly weigh the pros and cons. My son was asked at every appointment if he wanted to stop treatment or if he had any concerns about treatment whatsoever. Counseling was taking place the entire time. The Cameron's counselor would also meet with the doctor and my husband and I before medical interventions were decided upon. The interventions my son has had with extreme consideration, consent, and discussion have been counseling first and foremost, puberty blockers, and home run therapy. We have not even considered any kind of surgery and my child is 18. 
If any physician or member of the treatment team had suggested surgery to us when Cameron was a child, we would have said no thank you and immediately gotten a second or third opinion. With the benefit of hindsight, I have no doubt that the health care my son accessed was life-saving. I am grateful that we have had access to this incredibly crucial, medically necessary health care for our son without the interference of our government. Cameron is thriving now. He is doing better than he ever has. He has wonderful friends. He's dating a little. He has spoken out publicly and has the love and support of his whole family, including two grandparents who are staunch conservative Christian Republicans. We can all see that this is who he is. The grandparents don't fully understand what being transgender really means, but they love and accept him. I'm asking you today to please allow parents the right to access and consent for health care for their children. This decision should be made with parents, the child, and the child's medical providers without government interference. Thank you. A question for you, Ms. Cole, and, and first of all, thank you for, for being here. Um, I've heard some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle use words like, this frightens me, this hearing. They're, they're frightened by us having a hearing in which you are able to speak to the world about what you have gone through. And I've heard colleagues on the other side of the aisle say, life is worth it in the context of pushing a particular worldview and saying life is worth it. I would just ask to say that I just want to make sure that you know, like from our standpoint, that your life is worth it and that the people that have gone through this, that your lives are worth it. And I'd wondered if you'd like to comment on the worth of your life and the social pressures and the pressure placed on you to pursue a path that you now believe was not the correct path. I think we're all on the same page here, that everybody's life and right to happiness is worthy. And that's what we're all fighting for, even if we don't necessarily agree on what that means. And if I may ask, um, would I be able to address um, another witness? Um, through the chair, you may. So you may okay. speak to me and reference uh, any other testimony you wish to. Okay. Well, um, Mrs. Reynolds. And you can, you can direct it to me and say that, that you, what Ms. Reynolds talked about, you want to respond to, and you go ahead. Well, I, I, I understood that um, Mrs. Reynolds is scared for her child. And I just want to set the record straight that I don't hate her. I don't think anybody in this room hates her. Um, in fact, I, I see my own mother and my own father in her, and that she, clearly she dearly loves her child, and she's doing the best with what she's been given. And unfortunately, it's not much. And for that, I'm sorry. I mean, I think every parent deserves the most, the utmost grace and guidance with how to help their child. That being said, I don't wish for her child to have the same result as I did. I don't wish for anybody to regret transition or to detransition because it's incredibly difficult. It comes with its own difficulties and it's not easy. And I hope that her child gets to have a happy and fulfilling adulthood, however that may look like. Well, thank you for that, Ms. Cole. Um, I think it was heartfelt and I know that uh, a number of us share your view. Um, one last question as my time is winding down. Do you believe that the American healthcare system failed you? On every single level. Thank my you. doctors and systemically. Thank you for being here. Before I, I begin my questioning, uh, I have to say this has been so deeply disturbing on a number of levels. And what we have seen today is what we've been seeing this entire Congress, which is an effort by my Republican colleagues and indeed some of the more extreme voices in the Republican Party to keep Americans on a treadmill of rage. Whatever the latest issue is that they want people to be angry about, they do their best to keep Americans on a treadmill of rage. And they get their Fox or Newsmax or whatever right-wing media outlet uh, of the moment is, they get their, their viewers, they get a clip from this hearing that gets displayed, it gets put on Twitter, and they make money. That's what all of this is all about, unfortunately. Thank you, and thank you to our witnesses. You, we appreciate you being here to share your experiences and help everybody understand um, both the very personal stories 
that are implicated in this issue, as well as some of the political agendas that are being pushed. Um, it is remarkable that our majority colleagues were not able to find any medical professionals to back their claims in today's hearing, other than an edited video, video of someone who actually has refuted their conclusions. And much of what we've heard today really is playing to and from some of the furthest extremes of right-wing ideology and fear-mongering. But I am absolutely disgusted by the Republican majority's bullying, bigoted frame, framing of an issue that would otherwise be worthy of serious discussion. What we are witnessing today is nothing less than a taxpayer-funded platform for congressional Republicans to bully transgender kids who are already some of the most vulnerable members of our community. That is why it is so infuriating that congressional Republicans are using their megaphone to single out transgender kids and their parents by labeling their very existence to be a social problem. Judging from the lineup of witnesses, it appears that there is no limit to the topics over which Republicans want to bully trans kids and their parents today. Undoubtedly, transgender youth participation in sports will be discussed because Republicans think it is a winning political talking point. But the facts do not justify the fears that Republicans and their political allies gin up over the fairness of trans girls participating in girls' athletic teams, nor the further stigma that attaches to transgender children.